Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe, socially distancing, wearing a mask, and uh, doing everything you can to take care of those uh, you hold closest to you. Um, this is the first monologue I'm recording under the uh, new, uh, uh, under our 46, since we've had our, our 46th president uh, inaugurated. Um, and it honestly feels as though a massive, uh, weight has been uh, lifted off of my shoulders, um, not having to record uh, un and create under the specter of doom that was uh, the previous administration. Uh, I'm feeling, I'm excited about it and I'm feeling optimistic. Um, there is still work to be done and there are a lot of other uh, bad actors in, uh, in, in the political sphere that, uh, that need to be addressed. But uh, in the in this current moment, I'm looking. F uh, I'm feeling a sense of relief, and then uh, looking and, and and making a promise to myself uh, t to be active and to not let my attention lapse, uh, lest we fall into a you know the empire falls, but then we fall into a, a first order kind of situation, which um, plays into uh, Star Wars references. Play will play in heavily into our our show today. Um, because my guest on the show today is a film director, uh, Taylor Morton, who um, he's a documentary filmmaker. He directed a incredible uh, third wave ska documentary called Pick It Up. Um, but you most likely are aware of his most recent film, uh, his most recent documentary uh, called The Last Blockbuster, which uh, covers uh, the last blockbuster in existence, which, uh, if you weren't aware, is located in Bend, Oregon. Um, it's a incredibly wonderful documentary. It has uh, it has heart, has emotional moments, and it, I found it incredibly interesting as a movie fan and as someone who spent a lot of time uh, renting movies from Blockbuster in my youth. I uh, I really really enjoyed it. it. Brought up a lot of uh, of memories of the first time I saw a lot of movies that I I now love and and consider important uh, to me and my creative uh, development. Um, I'll tell you guys this, uh, cause we're, we're going to talk uh, a lot about Blockbuster, uh, today with Taylor, but, uh, I'll tell you guys this, uh, this story. So I, I remember getting very in intent. My, I remember when I first started getting in intense, uh, intensely into movies and, and interested in them as opposed to just being a, a casual fan of, of movies. I remember, uh, I was a freshman at Towson University. Uh, I was coping with a really bad, uh, breakup. Uh, I was coping, well, the breakup itself wasn't that bad. I just didn't handle it very well. Um, and because I was not in a band at the time, I had no uh, songwriting outlet uh, in order to, to vent uh, my, my, my sadness, uh, which for the greater good of the world is, uh, is probably we're fortunate because otherwise there could be an EP of some very uh, self-pitying uh, lack of perspective uh, Th um, subpar uh, punk rock out there um, and I remember because my social calendar suddenly had a lot of holes on it and I remember most weekends uh, when I was in college going to the the on-campus uh, video store and renting two movies on Friday night watching watching them both uh, by myself uh, while I would order Chinese and then I remember returning them uh, the Saturday and renting two more movies so I was watching like four movies uh a weekend and then doing my schoolwork and that was kind of my the beginning of my education of of getting more into uh i guess i'll, I'll say actively observing film uh so getting reliving some of this and and discussing uh blockbuster and documentary filmmaking and and taylor's kind of journey through uh through uh the filmmaking uh and and also as you might imagine because he also directed a documentary about third wave ska there's some uh, musical overlap uh here as well and uh if you're familiar with some of my musician interviews you won't be surprised where this ends up um we we discuss uh we discuss playing in in japan which i will do someday i hope so um but uh, that's but uh, that's neither here nor there. N needless to say, I'm very excited to uh, to share this interview with you. If you enjoyed this, uh, or if this is your first time listening to this podcast because uh, Taylor's on, 
I really appreciate you taking the time to check out this show. Uh, we are available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to reach out to me, I am on Twitter at Comic Will Carry, and I'm on Instagram at Will Carry Two Three. I, I would love to hear from people who listened to this show and enjoyed it. So thank you guys very much for being here. And uh, let's go to my conversation with uh, the director of the last blockbuster, Taylor Morden. I'll say Taylor, I really, I loved your, your movie, dude. It was uh, for me as I l watch a lot of documentaries and this was the, one of the few documentaries where nobody is dead at the end or like swaths of people are dead at the end where I was like very emotionally invested in, in, in what I was, in what I was watching. So kudos to you for pulling off uh, a pretty spectacular emotional arc uh, in your, in your film. I really, really enjoyed it, man. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll say specifically like the, the, my favorite part, um, was when you start handing out the, uh, the old VHS, uh, box to everybody and, and getting everybody's reactions. I have a very specific movie that I associate with that box. And I'm curious if there is a movie for you that w when you hold that box, you instantly think of, uh, of when you rented it. No. No, there wasn't a specific one. I didn't have Blockbuster back when we had VHS. So uh -huh. for me, it's the DVD case. Mm -hmm. um, when we had VHS, it was uh, I rented tapes from the gas station near my house. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> they came in these clear plastic cases uh -huh. that didn't have the movie cover, didn't have anything. And they were just clear plastic. And so I have a very strong connection to those. But... Um, it would be a different movie every week. So no specific movie for me. Gotcha. Cause I think one of the last uh, movies I remember renting on VHS and you might've, you might've seen it from blockbuster was SLC punk with uh, Matthew Lillard. Did you great ever movie. see that? Oh, it's, it's such, it's such a great movie. That was like one of the last ones. And, and for me, especially because this was like right before I went off to, I, I went off to college and I was like really starting to get into watching movies that were not my, uh, my parents taste, uh, th yeah. that particular one, it was, was vital for me. That's awesome. Yeah. It was probably like one of the first like low budget movies I saw. I saw also like realizing you didn't need like a major studio to, uh, to, to make, to make something, which is a uh, pretty cool. Um, I was also curious how, when did, uh, filming for the last blockbuster start? Because it's, it feels like you've, it seems like you're filming this for like several years, like leading up right up until the pandemic hit. So I'm curious, when did uh, filming st uh, officially start? Um, almost four years ago now. It was the very beginning of 2017 when we started. Mm-hmm. 20, 2017. And when, and when you started, did you know you were going to end up filming the, the last blockbuster in existence? Or did you have that realization while you were... Uh, making the movie yeah we had no idea um when we started there were still over a dozen blockbusters left in the world and if you had asked me then if this one would be the last one i would have thought you were crazy mm -hmm. um, because i we all thought for sure the stores in alaska would be the last ones and yeah. you know at the time I didn't even know if we were making a movie. I was just fascinated by this blockbuster video in my town here and wanted to bring cameras by and film. So we got really lucky in the fact that the store that happens to be, it still is like a mile from my house, um, just happened to become the last one. And that's, you know, that's kind of the joy of documentary filmmaking is when something like that happens because we, and if we had tried to make that happen, we could never have pulled it off. Right. It's just kind of one of those kind of like happy, like happy, like twists of fate. And then you just kind of, kind of roll with it. That, yeah. that, that makes, uh, I, I relate to that because like, I, I kind of sketch out where I'm when I do podcasts, but, and I have a couple of things that I like to talk, but I never plan out a hundred percent, uh, what I'm going to discuss because I'm not a journalist. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <Neither> am I. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or when it comes to, to comedy, because it seems like we, um, you have know a lot of people in the Los Angeles comedy scene. Like most comics I know never go up with a, a script. They have like maybe a 70, 30, 
uh, idea of, of what they're what they're going to do, uh, and then the rest is just kind of whatever will will happen once you you get on stage. And and so you're originally you're you're originally from Bend. Kind of. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco, and my parents were divorced, so my dad lived up here in Oregon, and I would come spend summers up here uh, mm -hmm. near Bend. And um, I moved up here in junior high, so I I consider myself. Oregonian, but I did spend my first 13 years in San Francisco for the most part. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so start in San Francisco and you said, and were you aware of, the, and you weren't aware of this blockbuster when you were younger, you said you rented movies from the, the gas station near your house. Yeah, we lived. Um, so Bend is a really small town, about 90,000 people. Mm -hmm. And um, the next town over about two and a half hours away is Eugene, which is considerably larger Mm -hmm. And where I lived as a kid was right in between, like halfway in between these two towns in a town called Vita, which has like a hundred people in it. It's a, one of those, you know, one gas station, no, uh -huh. nothing else towns uh, yep. on, on the middle of uh, a route between two other places. And so I would live, I lived in this my dad owned a restaurant and there was a house attached. So I lived in the house attached to the restaurant. I would wash dishes and stuff to raise, mm -hmm. you know, earn money. And um, you could also return bottles and cans. Uh, in Oregon, there was a five cent deposit Yeah, yeah. for soda cans and things. And we went through a lot at the restaurant and things. So I would usually once a week, I would gather up all the bottles and cans in a big garbage bag and I would walk. It's like a third of a mile from my house to this gas station, return all the cans and hopefully it would be enough, you know, for a dollar seventy five or whatever it was to rent a VHS tape. Uh -huh. So that was my movie renting experience. But it took hours, you know, it took all day really to gather the coins, walk down, rent the movie, walk back, rewind the movie if it wasn't rewound. Sure. And then I would finally get to watch it and it would be like the net starring Sandra Bullock. And it was, <laughs> I didn't know any better to know that that wasn't a good movie at the time. I just loved the process. And I, I loved movies so much that I would, I would do that most, most weekends when I was a, a young teenager before I could drive the, the half mile to the gas station. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you're in a town where there's not just not like a ton going on. Cause I'm from uh, where I grew up, I grew up about an hour south of Washington, D.C., in what is essentially like beach resorts or like where pe like people who live and work in D.C. Uh, have like their summer homes. But I was there year round and there was just not a not a ton going on, not a ton going on. So when I got like uh, like a little part time job, the I, I had a part time job at Kmart and the Kmart was in the same shopping center as the Blockbuster. So um, I was eventually uh, you know, I was just kind of in that, in that cycle. So I was like, I would like go make my six dollars as a cashier and then go pick up my, my two. Cause this was when it was like unlimited rentals and I would get, you could get two at a time. So I would, oh, yeah. I would be there like, like every, every single day. It, it certainly that was showed... later. That was later for me. I didn't discover blockbuster until I moved to Eugene for college. And there were a couple of blockbusters there. Uh, but I also love the indie mom and pop video stores because they would have the, the cool movies, the weird movies, and then Blockbuster had yes. all the new releases. So I had that same two at a time monthly membership, but I would like go to Blockbuster and get the new releases and then also go to the mom and pop one and get some weird other movie. And I'd be going, you know, <laughs> to all these different Blockbusters and video stores and, and all that. Um, and it was. I loved Blockbuster, the convenience of it, the, um, like you said, that you could rent two at a time, unlimited for a month. And then for a while they were doing DVDs by mail to compete with Netflix. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could get that on top of the other deal. So you could have three at a time. One would come in the mail and they'd have the stuff that the store didn't have. Uh -huh. And then you could exchange those in the store for another rental instead of mailing it back. That was their advantage over Netflix at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they had like the the convenience of online and they and the the brick and mortar location. Yeah, yeah, it's in not a lot of I think a lot of people forget it's really important to have access to both a blockbuster and an independent place because uh you were not going to find like 
you were not if like you you were not going to find anime for rent at Blockbuster at, at that era. You were not going to find anything on the Criterion Collection. I remember getting spending like hundreds of dollars in college to like because I was minoring in film and studying acting. I remember spending hundreds of dollars to get like Kurosawa movies at Borders, uh, yeah. or or like yeah, Igmar Bergman movies. It's not like now when everything's on the internet. I remember we. I had a film class in college and I think we like had to share, there were like four or five DVDs the class had and we would like pass them around. Everybody would take them home and watch them mm -hmm. and like we'd trade them back and forth and they were probably from the school library because yeah, Blockbuster didn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. Or it's always, or what I found out, it was very important to have like, like, like I always had a couple friends that were like, I was a weird kid, but there were always some kids that were a little weirder by me. And if you go over it and to that kid's house, then they'll have, they'll have like what you're looking for also usually. Um, yeah, that was a real fun thing back in the nineties and early two thousands. I had some friends who had big VHS and DVD collections and so did I, and we would always swap mm -hmm. movies, but like so much so that we would have like sign out sheets. Cause you'd have to remember who borrowed your movie to make yep. sure you got it back. So we would have like our own video rental stores in our apartments <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you can you can borrow that you know that copy of clerks but you got to sign out you got to leave you know leave me 20 bucks and then you can have your 20 bucks back when you bring it back oh that's great it's like a, it's like a little commune it's like a little entertainment commune so you yeah. knew so you knew early on that you loved movies enough that you were walking you were you were schlepping bottles and cans uh and walking miles to get to the to mm -hmm. the gas station so you knew that that much like in your youth was there one of those movies you rented from the gas station that you remember like holy shit this is incredible and like you knew it was incredible not like the net that's hard it was probably later in life before i realized movies could be bad you, uh -huh. know, you know that that thing when you're like young like up to I, I was probably 13 or 14 before i realized movies could be bad uh-huh like, <laughs> like I was one of those people who watched um, Star Wars Episode One when it came out in '99 mm -hmm. a bunch of times in the theaters, and it took me I don't know 12 years to realize that that wasn't a great movie. You know, I was right. just so enamored by movies in general, and I didn't we didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't get to go to movie theaters a lot as a kid. So the few movies I saw in the theater, like I have very vivid memories of like Sister Act Two because I saw it in a theater yeah, and I loved it. I had never laughed as hard at anything in my life as sister act two, but <laughs> you know, in hindsight, that's not the best comedy movie of the nineties. It's mm -hmm. fine. But so I don't uh, rental wise. I loved all of them for different reasons. There was, there would be ones I would go back to, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, I think when Terminator 2 came out, that was a, a big one of like, oh man, this one's kind of awesome. Uh, Aliens was a big one. Mm -hmm. But that was also around the time of uh, Columbia House had these deals where you could get, uh, it was a mail away service, you could get like 12 VHSs for a penny and then you were part of their subscription service. Oh yeah, like uh, the record club. Just like the record club, but they did them for movies too. And oh. so I had this weird collection of VHS as a kid that, you know, cause when you're a kid, you, you sign up for all of those and then you never finish the subscription and you just like pretend, well, I'm a kid. What are you going to e do? Exactly. I'm not legally allowed to enter into this contract. That is that your oversight. You send. Yeah. You send that letter, have your parents sign it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that collection of VHSs that I had, from that like those 12 movies i probably watched over and over and over again so i thought like these are the best movies mm -hmm. but it was just probably five that i actually wanted and then the other seven were just whatever was because it wasn't a big catalog it was a one-page ad in a mm -hmm. rolling stone magazine yeah so there were maybe 60 movies on it and most of them were not great so yeah it's it's the the physical equivalent of like what what's going to be playing on the what's playing on TNT at like two in the afternoon on Sunday. Right. Right. And you get that. And then like, that's your collection. And then again, when DVDs came out, um, I was a pretty early adopter of, I had a DVD player, but they were really expensive at the time. And I had like 
three DVDs mm -hmm. for a really long time. It was like Gladiator, The Matrix, and um, I don't know, one other movie, but like I didn't have cable where I lived, and this was in the dial-up internet age, so I would right. just watch Gladiator every day for probably a year. It's just what I did, and I watch it with the director's commentary and without the director's commentary, and watch the special features, and then watch the movie again. It's, uh -huh. like, that's just what we had. I am vibing. I, I'm relating so hard to to to, <laughs> to your origin story right here, uh, because I remember uh, my first DVD player was was my PlayStation Two, so I remember I remember having that and getting Mission Impossible Two and watching that a bunch of times, and then I remember being particularly enamored um i had seen jurassic park by that by the time it was out on dvd but i had not seen the very detailed uh james earl jones narrated like documentary about the making of jurassic park so like finding like watching that over and over again and like that became like my ambient like music to fall asleep to was yeah. james earl jones talking about uh they were going to use go motion dinosaurs and then they learned that uh computer technology mm -hmm. is the the way to go so yeah. like learning how like seeing the behind the scenes aspect of it was so fascinating because that was like yeah. the first time i think most of like the movie going public was seeing that because up until then vhs's didn't have a ton of special features there was one and i same like my film school was dvd special features and making ofs and uh -huh. just commentaries and all that but there was one when i was a kid um that we had because my brother my older brother was a huge Star Wars fan and that he mm -hmm. passed down to me. And so he had the VHS box set way before the special editions. There was one that had all three movies and it had a fourth tape. And the fourth tape was a little documentary called From Star Wars to Jedi, The Making of a Saga. Mm -hmm. And it had, it was probably like 40 minutes and it was just like a, uh, a behind the scenes DVD thing. It's on the special edition DVDs now if you watch them. But mm -hmm. um, at the time, like this was the late eighties, early nineties, there was nothing like that. Um, yeah. HBO would do these little like five minute making of featurettes for their movies. Mm -hmm. Those would be on like the way HBO worked is movies are like, however long they are an hour and 30 hour 45. And then the next movie doesn't start until like, on the hour. So the six mm -hmm. o'clock movie ends at seven forty, and then they have to put in 20 minutes of nonsense so they could start the next movie at eight. So they would have these little 10 minute making of shorts. And that was like my favorite thing on HBO where these little making of featurettes for movies of like, Oh man, look at that. And there's, that's the real people. And there's a, what does that guy do? What's that job? I had no idea. Uh -huh. So there was a little bit of that, but then when DVD came out, it like it just exploded because everybody loved special features that was the big deal you know you could put the movie on the disc but also you could see the making of and they'd interview the cast and they'd interview and the director would talk over the movie i i just i couldn't believe how awesome that was as oh, someone yeah. who loved movies um and it, sadly they just they don't do that as much i mean there's tons of content on YouTube for every movie, right? I see mm -hmm. a new movie now on Netflix and I jump to YouTube to see like the behind the scenes or the interviews or whatever they've done, but it's not quite the same. It's not, you know, packaged for me with a nice menu and all that. Mm -hmm. So, Oh yeah, totally. Uh, one of your interview subjects, uh, Kevin Smith, he was, he's great about just throwing tons of extras at you. He'll throw like an hour and a half documentary about, about the movie that'll go on like, a 20 minute tangent about how they got Zach and Miri down from NC 17 to R uh, like tons of stuff. Like I, I really miss that too. I, I have some, I have, I have one of my favorite movies that hits all three of those things. Uh, Titanic. I, I remember being a kid and just being obsessed with the story of the Titanic. And then when the James Cameron movie was coming out, they HBO did like a half hour on the making of, and then I remember the day it came out on that two disc on that two VHS set where you have like every, everything's great, everything's going to hell on on uh, the sinking starts on the second VHS. I remember going driving. We'd I lived uh, 
driving to the adjacent county, going over the bridge, which was a big deal to go over the bridge for my parents, uh, and getting it at, at and watch getting it at Blockbuster and watching it at a on a school night. And then I remember years later finding like a three disc collector's edition used for like seven bucks that just showed you every conceivable possible thing. Anything that you can think of you want to know uh, what the special effect behind what they did in that movie was on this DVD. It was incredible. Yeah. That, that's Titanic was awesome. Um, it came up when we were making our documentary. It didn't make it into the film because it's just like a weird anecdotal thing but it was one of the biggest flops for blockbuster um, oh really of all time because it had so much hype like they thought oh man this is the biggest movie that's ever come out we're gonna need 200 copies at every store because it's gonna be the rental movie of whatever month it came out Mm -hmm. Um, but it was also the first one of the first movies that was marketed as you got to own this you're going to want to own this movie Mm -hmm. and so it was at every you know target and walmart and the vhs was like the biggest seller that christmas as a gift and everybody Mm -hmm. who was going to rent it ended up just buying it so blockbuster had all these copies (laughs) that nobody wanted to rent it because everybody had it it was like the biggest seller for home video ownership and it really messed up their like pre-algorithm algorithm where they thought uh-huh. oh, we're going to need a million copies of titanic and turns out most people who wanted to watch it just owned it yeah that's that's fascinating like one of the biggest movies of all time flops as a flops as a rental but then like one of what i think is maybe the greatest movie ever made the shawshank redemption bombs at the box office for a a lot of for a lot of reasons i've watched a lot of documentaries on little clips on youtube about why it bombed about uh you know the tough on crime 90s didn't want to see prisoners in a as human beings um but that goes on to be like one of the biggest rentals ever yeah yeah there were a lot of movies like that in that era like towards the mid to late 90s um even 80s movies that found a second life at the video store and you know whether they were like all of kevin smith's movies did not do well at the box office Mm -hmm. they were huge at the video rental store you know that it's just the way it was and you think of like paulie shore movies or you know um, right what is it boondock saints was a huge Mm -hmm. box office flop and then a giant rental movie so that's something that we've also lost if you think about the way the world works now is movies get their one shot and then that's it. You know, if it comes out on Netflix and it's not popular, it's not going to get a second life at Hollywood video. Like, like it used to, it's just going to still be on Netflix and still not be popular. Yeah, exactly. Maybe eventually you'll catch it when it goes from Netflix to Hulu or Hulu to HBO Max. Right, or... that's the only time things get a second life is if they change hands. Like the office just left one streamer for another and they like found more special features. So they're promoting it right now, which is mm-hmm. it's like everybody has watched that show 10 times. I mean, I guess it'll find a new audience because they found a couple more deleted scenes. I don't know. I, I think so, but you're you're completely, completely right. I remember seeing... Clerks for the first time at like the little on campus uh, video store in college because uh, I was I was I was in a, like a pit of depression because my girlfriend had broken up with me at the time so I was just going there like every fri- every Friday and Saturday just watching four movies a weekend doing doing nothing else and that was when I first saw Clerks um, that was when I was, I think I, that's when I first saw The Godfather and like all these movies that are like the best because my mom was only interested in like freaky friday and like uh and and i was only ever allowed to watch there were only ever like a a, there was a torrent of dis there was like a a deluge of disney movies through my house when i was when i was younger but it took me a while to get to like real cinema i wanted to ask you based on like the the physical movie physical rental theater theater going experience versus streaming i don't know if this i don't have any data to back this up but i feel like streaming has been instrumental to the popularity of the documentary in like the Michael Moore sense of a documentary compared to like a history channel documentary. Hmm. 
do you think that because i never remember like i i i only remember like watching documentaries i never watched like a documentary like bowling for combine and and until i until i got it on dvd um but i feel like a lot of documentaries exist now uh on streaming services do you think that yeah i i can't really outside of film festivals i don't know that i've seen a documentary in a theater Mm -hmm. like they used to be i would rent them on dvd for sure like it was always like at blockbuster they would have those um deals that would pop up like rent a new release get an old movie for free so i'd always like Mm -hmm. rent the new release that i wanted the third matrix movie or whatever sure and then oh i guess i i guess i will rent bowling for columbine or something because it's free Mm -hmm. Um, so the documentaries i consumed mostly that way but nowadays i mean it's hard to say because the boom in documentaries kind of happened at the same time as streaming Mm -hmm. um you know documentaries have been more and more popular since like inconvenient truth and supersize me and, and all that and that was a while ago yeah um so that was even like in the netflix dvd by mail uh era which i think also helped because as soon as movies um became free to people mm-hmm. like you pay a subscription and then individual movies don't cost anything it leveled the playing field because now you know my indie documentary that I made for no money costs the same for you to watch as Jurassic Park, which is an amazing spectacle of cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, before, when they cost the same and it was $5, very few people were going to rent the indie documentary or the documentary right. at all. Mm-hmm. Um, especially because, like you're saying, History Channel, Discovery Channel, 2020, you know, there's documentaries on TV all the time Um, yeah so maybe that has something to do with it too because tv is in this renaissance era of like tv is better than movies on most fronts right now you know oh yeah you're talking about the the big giant star wars spectacles but even that the mandalorian is kicking the movie's butt as, Mm -hmm. as far as like what's good so you know maybe with tv becoming a little bit more respected documentaries kind of got lifted up you know in that same wave of yeah i guess just content is content and if it's good it's good um but it's weird to think about like how documentaries are more popular now because you know i i also started making them in that time period so i'm like well of course i'm into them that's my job but i don't understand Mm -hmm. why the average person given the choice between a documentary and a jurassic park is not choosing jurassic park every time Part of me wants to th- to think, and this is something I was thinking about before we hopped on, is as well as like certain. I feel like certain films play better, like when you're like being like introverted in in your house or you're watching it on the couch versus seeing it in a theater. Kind of like like it's re- it's really awesome to see like Less Than Jake in like a really small club. That's a very different experience than watching them open for Bon Jovi in like an arena. If, Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense, I feel like documentaries lend themselves more to lend them more to that kind of introverted viewing experiences compared to like, uh, like Avengers Endgame, where that's like a night out. You're you're making a whole event event out of it. It's, uh, like you're, you're probably meeting up with friends. You're maybe you're, maybe you're getting drinks after and like, you want to have that moment where everyone in the theater when when robert downey jr goes i'm iron man and just snap and everyone's like holy fucking shit like you want to share that you want to share that with people the same way i also wanted to share getting sneaking uh uh, sneaking alcohol into the theater and getting drunk watching cats (laughs) right yeah there's the theatrical experience it in a lot of ways it doesn't lend itself to like a a heartfelt documentary film because you go to the theater to have fun not to learn so much like at least for me like i Mm -hmm. exactly the same like i love i'll go see endgame in the theater every time but you know it doesn't justify the 15 dollar ticket and the eight dollar popcorn to watch a documentary that's going to be just as good 
on my TV at home, you know, it's it's hard to sell that to people. But that said, the, the documentary I did that has less than Jake in it, my, my ska documentary, we did a run of uh, theatrical screenings that had, um, we usually had live music afterwards or we would have some mm-hmm. kind of a, a party. And that was just like what you're saying. People would go nuts when they saw their favorite band on screen or you know, sometimes the band would be there at the theater and it was an experience that you had to be there for. And that was really exciting. We would have wanted to do something like that with the last blockbuster, but because it was COVID times, it uh, sure. did not work out so well. We did a couple drive-in screenings, which was fun as like a, a fun retro movie thing, but it wasn't the same because you can't like hug people and you can't all hang out. Yeah, exactly. I think here's what I, here's what I think you could, could do it either uh, uh, post pandemic or maybe during the pandemic, you do a, you, you get, you get Kevin and Doug and a few other people and you, cause that blockbusters an Airbnb now, I think. And you guys have for one weekend. I, I say, I say last blockbuster comic book man crossover. You have a big old dude movie sl- uh, slumber party and film that that would be really entertaining. <laughs> yeah. That sounds fun. We really did want to do, a big event at Blockbuster. You know, our movie was finished right around when the pandemic hit. So we were, yeah, we had booked a big theater for our world premiere and we were going to do an after party at Blockbuster and, you know, invite Kevin Smith and Doug Benson and all those people up. Um, and it, it kind of fell apart like right when COVID hit. So all that stuff is still on the table, but it's a harder sell when your movie has been out for a year. Yes. Yeah, t- totally. The, the the this this thing kind of wrecked a lot of uh, fun things. Um, so so kind of so you say your your film school was kind of like DVD bonus features and such. Did you have a moment when you realized I'm going to be a film director? And then did you also have a moment when you're like I'm going to make a I'm going to make my first documentary? What were those moments for you? Yeah, well, so I was in the '90s when I was a teenager. I was the kid in the high school with the big VHS camcorder on my shoulder. Uh huh. You know, if you ever watch Beverly Hills 90210, that was the David Silver character in the first season before he got uh, cool, mm-hmm. and became a DJ. Uh, he had a VHS camera everywhere he went, and then the other kids were all annoyed, like, get the camera out of my face. And it was the 90s, so there wasn't social media or anything. You were filming stuff, and for the most part, no one would ever see it. Um, unless you got to do like a school presentation or something. Right. But I would do all my school reports. Uh, you know, if my teachers would let me do a video instead of a three page report on Egypt, I'm going to do a video on Egypt mm-hmm. or a, a video book report on Lord of the flies or whatever the thing was, I was making videos and my school, very, very, very small school. They didn't have classes for any of this, but I was able to wrangle in my senior year. I had independent study video production Mm -hmm. Um, at the time i was editing on two vcrs Uh, so you'd push play on the other one push record on the one and then to make a cut you would pause on the recording one and then fast forward to the spot you wanted and unpause both machines and if you wanted to add music you would plug your cassette player into the audio in and push play on a cassette tape while the video was playing this is how we edited in Oh my God. The, the mid nineties. And so I learned video editing that way. Um, and in my senior year of high school, the school got one copy of Adobe premiere 1.0 uh-huh. um, and a video capture card, which let you plug the VHS camcorder into the computer. And so I got like two months of digital edit. I got to do like one project and then uh, like I said, I didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't have a video camera. I was borrowing the school, so I had to give it back, graduated. Mm-hmm. I went to college and didn't really do video. I had like one class where, again, I borrowed a video camera and did a project. But um, what I was really focused on was music. I was playing in bands. and um, Oh, nice. Every once in a while, I, we would do a music video, and sometimes – I would help, but usually I'm in the video, so I wasn't like filming it or editing it uh, until a long time later, like a decade later, I was doing music and I was working in flash animation. This is 
to really date myself in the early 2000s flash was all over the internet and i was a flash yep. animator um and i moved to washington dc up in your neck of the woods mm -hmm. and um i was playing in bands and doing flash animation and we're still making music videos and paying people a lot of money to make music videos and i just i was seeing this was right when dslrs came out and they were like oh wow that looks great it looks like a movie for the first time mm -hmm. and you know i'm asking the guys shooting the video how much did that camera cost what's that what's that thing what's what are these lights what is an led what are you talking about all this stuff uh -huh. and so basically when it came time to do the next video and i was like well it would cost the same to just buy these cameras as it would to do another music video so i did that and i was making music videos and then i was making music videos for other bands because i had a camera and mm -hmm. then that kind of led into uh commercials and corporate work in dc and real yeah. estate and weddings and anything you could point a camera at so i became like a working videographer mm -hmm. also at that time flash died apple killed flash yeah so i was out of a job so i kind of had to figure out real quick how to make money with a video camera because yeah kind of to... sort of fell into my lap you know i hadn't really done it since the 90s um but I knew enough about editing and, you know, the software was pretty intuitive. So I got back into it. And then after four or five years of doing that, I moved back to Oregon and we had saved up a good amount of money from shooting a bunch of weddings and real estate and just commercial work and uh -huh. scrimping and saving and moved back here. And I moved to this small town and there was no work for me. You know, there were these, um, not a lot of companies here that need commercials, not a ton of weddings, not a ton of real estate, and like five companies here already doing it. They sure. didn't want anything to do with me. So um, I got here and I'm like, well, now I have all this equipment and all this time on my hands and no way to make money. I'm living off the savings. So I asked my wife if I could try making a documentary because I figured I, I figured I could. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. I think I can. Um, and she gave me one year. She said, yeah, we've got enough saved up. You can spend a year trying to make a movie. And if you fail, then you have to get a job. But if the movie makes money, you can make movies. And so that's what I did. That was 2015, 16. Uh, I made my first movie just to see if I could. And it broke even. It made a little bit of money. And mm -hmm. That was that was three feature films and a whole bunch of short films ago, and now it's this is all I do. That's awesome, dude. And was that 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 first documentary was that uh, pick it up or was that the refreshments? Uh, the refreshments one. The refreshments it started one. small. I figured they weren't a hugely popular band, and I could probably get access. Access, I think, is the main thing you need to make a good documentary. Yeah, um, you need an interesting subject, and you need pretty much unfettered access to that subject. So it worked out great uh, because they were very accessible mm -hmm. and amenable. They just sort of let me do it and they had a strong fan base. I figured I could, you know, if nothing else, they'll like this movie so I can make it for these, you know, however many thousand Facebook fans they have. Mm -hmm. And that's it, you know, and that'll be great. But it's it's gone on to do better than I had hoped. Um, but the Ska movie, same. I knew some bands from when I played in ska bands and, uh, and what did you play in these ska bands? I'm a trumpet player. Nice. Yeah. So ska was my, uh, ska's in your DNA. Ska's in your DNA. I can tell when I watched pick it up that somebody who has a lot of love for these bands made this movie, which is I think important as well. Yeah. And I made that one and the blockbuster movie at the same time. The blockbuster mm -hmm. movie took forever. It was happening in real time. Whereas Pick It Up um, was for the most part a historical documentary, so nothing has changed. You know, when you do a historical documentary, it's just there. You're just getting perspective and laying out the information and telling the story in an entertaining and emotional way, but nothing's going to change from when you start making it to when you finish making it. You know, history is history. It already yeah. happened. Uh, but with Blockbuster, things were changing every few months a new store would close or, you know, they would, we, we couldn't have predicted how popular it got when they became the last one. 
all that stuff happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like in New York filming for the Scott documentary and I get a phone call. It's like, you should come film at the store. Thankfully there were, it wasn't just me working on both of these movies. So we were able to do it. Um, but I do not recommend making two feature films at the same time for three years. It's a lot. Oh yeah. I, I can imagine. So, and then having to put like your, your inner, like your historical, like your, again, like your documenting of a time and, and different perspectives versus an ever evolving, ever continuous, uh, uh, event. Uh, I can yeah. imagine being jarring. Um, I am, I am curious because, um, I feel like there's a little bit of overlap between the kind of like documentary filmmaking interviewing and, and what I do in podcasts. Um, when you're interviewing, when you're interviewing somebody, do you go in with like, I want to, I, I have a specific thing I'm trying to, get, I'm trying to get out of them. And how do you get somebody to, to start talking? It really depends on the person. Um, some people are very open and friendly and, um, like in, in the blockbuster doc, we left in a lot of our sort of behind the scenes. Talking. Yeah. I thought that our was cool. Editor, our editor did that. He was very clever. He just thought it was a fun way to present something we've seen a hundred times is like, oh, they, we all know that in most documentaries, people are being prompted with a cue. Like we talk about this or can mm -hmm. you say it more, you know, like this, but usually they cut that stuff out. And so we right. decided to leave it in. Um, but it really depends on the person. Sometimes you got to warm up to the topics, you know, you want to get into. Sometimes you want to start with the real difficult stuff at the beginning, just in mm -hmm. case it's, and it depends when you're talking about like a celebrity interview, you usually have less time. Um, right. So, so you kind of got to get to the point. Yeah. You have to be selective. Like for blockbuster, we kind of knew the outline going into most interviews. And so we had all these bullet points we thought we wanted to hit, you know, like handing everybody the VHS tape and things like that. But we also had, like a, a much shorter prioritized list. Like, well, if we only get 20 minutes with somebody, what are the three things we're going to ask? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I tend to do it from some sort of an outline and that'll evolve. Like the Sky Doc took a full two years of filming. And so the first interviews were very different from the last interviews. By the time we were filming uh, with John Feldman from Goldfinger, uh -huh. the, there was a rough cut of the movie. So I knew what was in the movie. I knew which things to ask him about. And I knew we didn't need some other things that we had asked 20 other people about. So it changes sure. as you're going, if you're lucky enough to have some time and be editing as you go, um, that'll kind of evolve. But it's, it's like a skill set you develop. I think if you're just personable and you are nice to people, the other people will talk about stuff. And if they don't want to, it's usually pretty obvious. Sure. If they don't want to talk about something. And then you can, it's like, you know, touching a, a hot frying pan. Like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back to, let's go back to reminiscing about VHS tapes. That was fun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Feldman stuff in pick it up is, is great. Um, I, he hasn't responded to my Instagram message yet, but I love that dude. Uh, cause I, not only are Goldfinger, busy guy. not only are Goldfinger great, but I was looking through like all the stuff he like has produced or written on. And he, every band I liked in high school, he produced basically like the used yeah. story of the year. Good Charlotte, good Charlotte works with everybody. I love, I, I, I enjoy me some, some John Feldman. Uh, similar. Did you see the, did you see the extra clip of him on the DVD? Oh, uh, no, I, I didn't. What what was that? There's, there's a deleted scene um, that's just, he gave me a tour of his studio and he goes through and he's like, and here's the, the gold record from the used and here's the thing and here's the guitar we wrote this Blink-182 hit on and he's just, mm -hmm. it's a cool little uh, studio tour that didn't fit in the movie. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to go back on that. So, so my like home recording software, cause I, I, I've been teaching myself home recording in the pandemic. My guitar tones are his like, tone like stl tone hub pack so i nice. i can get those like gold finger like blink bass and guitar tones and i feel i'm super excited about it um leading into 
similar follow-up question because um, I, I feel like it, it appears that Lloyd Kaufman's kind of a prickly, cr- prickly character. And I've had a couple of interesting interviews on this on this show with uh, mostly older rock and roll uh, folks. Um, yeah. Hey, lips from Amble, um, uh, which I love the I love his band. I love the documentary about his band. But when you get somebody, because uh, because when I was interviewing Lips, I kind of had a hard time like getting like getting questions in, like I because I would talk like every twenty minutes. If you get somebody who's I'm gonna say like the interview equivalent of like a a bag of snakes how do you wrangle that so that you can get how, how what do you do so that you can kind of like get the answers to the the questions you were looking for yeah that's that's a great question um that doesn't happen that often uh lloyd kaufman was for sure the the like, most extreme example of that that i've encountered mm-hmm. um but also he's one of those people you know, I've watched his movies since I was 13, 14 years old. Uh, a lot of respect for the guy. I've watched his, his making of documentaries and read his books. And, um, you know, I consider him to be inspirational in the DIY indie filmmaking world. Oh, yes. Yeah. He is Lloyd Kaufman. He's who he is. So when I found out he had said yes, it would be in our movie, I was super excited. And we went to his house and we went there to film and he was sitting out on the porch reading a newspaper or something just like you'd expect. Uh, and he was super nice and super welcoming and can I get you something to drink and how are you doing? How are you guys? And I had uh, my DP with me and we set up the shots and he's super nice and we get him sitting in his little chair and we, we go to start the interview and all of a sudden he clicked into this other persona you know his public oh yeah Lloyd Kaufman persona so it was very jarring to me because I had just spent a half an hour talking to the guy I thought oh this is going to be great we're like best friends now you know uh-huh sure he's he's already sharing gems um because we were talking about independent movie he's like what how's the movie going how is your thing what cameras are you shooting on are you going to release this yourself or go through a distributor and most distributors are crooks and let me tell you why. And, and he's, (laughs) you know, really happy to be talking about the things he's happy about. And then as soon as we turn on the cameras and he knows we're going to talk about blockbuster, he knows he's the villain in a blockbuster story, you know, right. Like that kind of a filmmaker. So he's going to play up the heel like, like in pro wrestling. Exactly. Um, so as soon as that started, it, it threw me off, but I kind of caught on too after the first like three minutes of like, oh, he knows what he's doing. I'm not going to get him to say anything nice about Blockbuster. That's not what's going to happen here. Mm-hmm. So we kind of just leaned in and we have like a two hour interview that's pretty much unusable, filled with profanity and is very, very <laughs> negative. And then again, our, our fantastic editor decided to just throw it in as one little chunk of negativity in the movie. Um, Mm -hmm. It was still like a fun interview and it, like it was a challenge of like, uh, you know, he just turned on a dime and became so anti everything we were trying to do, but almost like it was a game. And like, once we all were on the same page of like, Oh, we're just, we hate blockbuster now. And that's the vibe. And, just keep this going. So I didn't go back and try to get him to fit into our narrative because yeah, he that, had his own agenda. Sure. And that happened on the Sky Doc too. There were people who had different opinions than the opinion I was trying to you know, put forward, but we were mm-hmm. much more wanting to include all of that on that one. Like I didn't have an outline. So when sure. you sit down with somebody and they're like, no, you know what? Screw West Coast bubblegum ska music. That's not even real music. You know, you get that vibe. You have to be kind of open to, okay, so what's your take on it? What's your angle and why? I guess I I guess I would dig for the why do you feel that way instead of just the sound bites. And that's that's the fun of it. But you got to be ready to abandon your list of questions and your outline. Oh yeah, to- that 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 makes that makes total sense. Because again, once you and being savvy enough to recognize like what's what's hap- 
what's happening. Then you can adapt to the to the situation much uh, much faster. Um, yeah. I'll say that worked brilliantly for the Scott documentary because it's one of those things. Scott's like social and political roots being coming from J- Jamaica and it's and the social political roots of reggae. It's one of those things that you kind of think, of course, there's political there's political Scott. Apparently, there's a a new wave of more political ska that's that's coming up now. Uh, but it's like one of those things like, yes, of of course. And then, uh, and then of course, like white people often do, he takes something cool and then kind of fuck it up a little bit. Um, but uh, that I found that I, that aspect of it, I wouldn't have known if not for those, those instincts of, of like, why do you think that? Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You got to get to the story behind the story especially when you're trying to make a, a 90 minute documentary about something that for the most part, people have never spent more than 10 minutes contemplating. I, yeah. I know <laughs> I, exactly. I will say that I have uh, lots of, most of my friends in high school, a lot of hardcore uh, ska people. And uh, I, re- uh, uh, and then I was very excited for the international stuff, the international bands too. Cause, um, because like, I had no idea there was ska in Mexico. I'm very excited to learn more about that. I know that Japan has amazing punk, uh, and I knew uh, and I know about the uh, the Ori ska band, uh, who I, I saw on Warp Tour a few years ago. So that section I thought was really really great. Also, yeah, the that stuff came out of my producer, um, also one of my good friends who I used to play in a ska band with. He is big in the ska scene in Japan. He still is. Um, mm-hmm. He works with Ori ska band, and he works with a lot really? of those bands and and uh, helps with like translating lyrics and things like that. And um, he and I, our band in the early 2000s, we were here in Oregon and not, you know, Scott really died out hard around the year 2000, late 99. Yeah. And so we were playing these dumb shows. No one was coming and it was stupid. And it was, you know, why are you guys still doing it? And we loved it and it was fun, but it wasn't, it wasn't cool like it had been in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we got really lucky, and because I think some of our members were Japanese and spoke Japanese, we got signed to a major label in Japan, and we got to tour there every summer. So awesome. we got to go, and Scott was still huge over there in the early 2000s. We were playing giant festivals and you know, playing all these awesome shows with all these awesome Japanese bands, and uh-huh. having the time of our lives. And so that was a huge part of my ska experience like the the movie is really my like ska life story as told by all of my musical heroes uh-huh. like I got, got to have buck 09 tell the story of them playing in japan which is really the exact same way i experienced it mm-hmm. you know oh yeah that that's so uh, so amazing my my one goal for my the band i'm in now is to get us big in japan because um i've spent some time over there I, I've, I've been there a couple of times and it's just like the most amazing place one of the most amazing places i've i've ever been and their music scene scene has so much cool sounding stuff that i'm i'm into that's yeah. that's very very cool are the audiences where the audience is all like very polite like buck talks about like everyone like sits down and then like claps very politely because that's been my i've heard a lot of people say that japanese audiences are like very very polite and respectful yeah they can be and they certainly were then um i went back the last time i was there for music was 2015 so six years ago now um and it was less like that Mm -hmm. but it was more i was going to like bar shows i went and saw a ska band and um it it was a little bit more casual but i feel like Mm -hmm. at the like club shows that people have paid good money for it's still kind of like that where they're nice and polite and you can't tell if they're digging it or not until you like you know they they're really really good at call and response in japan Uh so if you say you know everybody say yeah they all will do it like with so much enthusiasm like you never would see it at an american crowd unless you're green day or something so like Mm -hmm. it's both sides they seem more excited and also less excited yeah. It's very odd. Uh, I, I would like that. I've been to so many sh- I've been to some shows in Bushwick where like everyone's just arms crossed the entire the entire time. And I'm just like, this this is not this is not how we do it. 
That's not not how it's <laughs> supposed Why to be are done. You here? Yeah, it's like you you look you look angry to be here. <laughs> Um, that's, that's incredible. Um, question about shooting music, music videos. Um, if you're sh shooting, a, if you're shooting a music video, are you like, tr you're there, there are the bands obviously lip syncing the song, but are you like just playing the song? Like with a, with a, a, a like a two second, like click before the song starts. Are there some kind of like, right. are there some kind of like basic things you could, t you would tell someone who's shooting a music video for the first time? Yeah, um, there's a couple of basic things. One, try to get if you, if you're shooting a music video for a band and the band has a drummer, mm -hmm. you have a problem because yeah. there's almost no way to play your backing track louder than a real drum set. So we would do things like you know you can take all the drum heads off and put towels inside the drums mm -hmm. so that you can still hit them. Um, and we don't make the sound. Um, we would also, we used to put a lot of tape on all the cymbals to make them quieter, but then you could start, you'd see it because when they flip up, you can see the bottom of the cymbal. So yeah, um, we stopped doing that. At some point, I worked on a couple of music videos where we had a set of cymbals that were, it was basically just two of the same cymbal hot glued to itself. Mm -hmm. So it looks right. But when you hit it, it's super quiet um, because it can't vibrate. Right. It's just glued. Um, so things like that are really good to keep in mind. Adding a count off if the song starts, you know, if everybody's in, mm -hmm. you need you need a count off. Um, and I would just record them myself. You know, I would do like a click track, beep, boop, boop, boop. Mm -hmm. And then I would say three two, one, one, go, you know, or whatever, one, two, three, four. Um, Cause when you don't do that, it's hard, very hard to get the first beat um, all in sync. And then the, the biggest tip uh, and to your point of everybody's lip syncing is don't let them lip sync. Uh, it, your singer for your music video, make them sing. Okay. They, they sing along so that it matches, but there's something inherently different looking and you can kind of, once you get an eye for it, you can tell in music videos when they're lip syncing and when they're actually singing, mm -hmm. and it just looks better if they're actually singing uses different muscles, makes it emote more. So mm -hmm. yeah, those, those are my tips backing track, get your drums as quiet as you possibly can. Cause you're going to be listening to them over and over and over again, usually in a small room right? for, a, you know, your ears are going to die and then, and then make your singer sing. Yeah. They so, don't have to sing at full volume if they got to do like a hundred takes, but it's going to look better. Yeah. Cause you can see like they're putting phys physical effort in. That's why I, I think born in the USA by Bruce, you could tell Bruce Springsteen's actually singing, even though the syncing is, ter is very bad on that video. Like right. you look at him and, and like his perform his performance. Cause he's like, Bruce fucking Springsteen. Right. Um, and that's the other way to do it is you can shoot a music video with no uh, playback and no backing recording if the band is good enough. And then it's on you when you're editing to sync everything back up. But if it's a band that's played a song live a hundred times you know, and they know the tempo pretty well, you can just record them playing it a bunch of times. But the editing becomes a lot more work. And you sometimes end up with a Bruce Springsteen video where it's not quite in sync. Gotcha. Right on. Um, that That's very helpful. Cause I, I sort of do, uh, I, I sort of, I went to school for acting and, and movies, but I, I do everything. I'm, I'm in bands. I do, po I, I'm a, I podcast. I do stand up. I, I kind of do everything. So I'm always trying to learn uh, more about how to make things without relying on other people. So I, I appreciate that. Um, couple more things and then and then I'll, I'll i'll let you go i really appreciate uh th i i hope th this has been a great conversation for me i hope this has been enjoyable for you uh yeah it's fun taylor um so i've been i've been eyeing uh baby yoda and the stormtrooper in your your background um i personally thought season two of the mandalorian was is maybe my favorite season of television i just thought every episode continued to be more and more awesome i haven't read a ton of the details of this new wave of 
movies they're going to get. Um, I, I like you. Star Wars is one of my favorite things. What is something you would really love to see in like the the next batch of the Star Wars universe explored? Because Rises of Rises of Skywalker kind of left a, a bad taste in my mouth. The more I think, the more I think about it. I loved Force Awakens and uh, most of the Last Jedi, but Rise of Skywalker just didn't quite do it for me. What is something you hope to see next for Star Wars? I like. Um, first of all, I like all of it. I will. I will uh, just put that out there. I can even tolerate some stuff in the prequels, but I don't like this new wave of of uh, angry fans. Yeah, they like, they got to go. Of even just people who don't like these movies, it's like that's fine. You know, you don't have to. I don't know. I if you had told me in the '90s that they were going to make six more, eight more Star Wars movies and, you know, 26 episodes of a, a TV show about a Mandalorian and then a Boba Fett show and then a, you know, an Obi-Wan show and then all these things. I'd have been like, great, that's the world I want to live in. That's, yeah. oh, and the number one movie is going to be uh, based on this comic book that I've been reading my whole life. Great. That's also going to be true. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so I'm just really happy that it all exists like we live in a world the nerds won we took over everything we did all of the highest grossing things movies are nerd based and then video games are outgrossing movies because everyone plays video games now it's not just for you know mm -hmm. the awkward kids anymore so and football players watch dragon ball z exactly exactly so that's that's to preface like what I would like out of more Star Wars is just like, I'm just happy we have as much as we have. Uh, but my favorite things, um, and I'm not super well-versed on the upcoming slate of movies and TV shows they've announced, but my favorite recent Star Wars thing is Rogue One. I love- Yeah, like, Rogue One was great. I love a self-contained movie where it's not relying on Yes, there's Easter eggs in it, and there's Darth Vader and Princess Leia at the end, spoiler alert, but it's not dependent on somebody knowing what happened in the other eight Skywalker saga movies, or, you know, even with The Mandalorian now, it's so Easter egg heavy and so nostalgia heavy. It's like, yeah, that Boba Fett episode was amazing, and we finally got to see him actually beat up some people. Mm -hmm. instead of just looking cool um but i want to see new things i want to see somebody just come up with a new thing yeah like, that's kind of what baby yoda is is like a new idea but even that is just like it's a gremlin with no fur on it you know it's <laughs> yeah we still don't have a, a name for the species yet right right but what what would be awesome is like and and they'll get too much crap for it i think is is why it doesn't happen but like when they do a new thing like with mandalorian they introduced beskar it's like this indestructible thing that can fight with lightsabers and then we're like well why didn't they just make all the spaceships out of it back in the thing and then the nerds get angry and it's complicated and it's like yeah but they added it's all adding there's new things and there's more things and that's great the problem with doing it within the existing timeline mm -hmm. is that people are going to get cranky. If you like, even right now, people are like, well, Luke has Grogu, but we know all of Luke's students die before episode seven. So does Grogu die? Does, does Kylo Ren kill Grogu? It's like if they had just made the Mandalorian take place outside of what we know mm -hmm. and not have Luke's and Boba Fett's and just have it be, then they can do anything. And that's what I'm excited about is like do, do something where there's no consequences for, you know, blowing something up or a character not living happily ever after. That's again, why I like Rogue One is because the, yes, we knew those characters probably weren't going to pop up, but if you had told me they all just went off to another planet and started a commune, I'd be like, yeah, that, that checks out. Yeah, totally. It, it it's, exists on, on its own as its own, its own thing. Um, yeah, I'm very eager to see what they, 
what they do next. I'm just looking looking forward to it. And because it's not my entire identity, uh, I'm able to just kind of enjoy it and and let it make me happy, uh, especially at a time in in a span of time where the world. I've been needing things to make me happy. I mean, I love, I got, I love my wife. I got married a few months ago, but congratulations. Thank you. But uh, yeah, it's the, there's the world's too shitty to, to freak out about, uh, about star Wars in my personal opinion. So I agree with you completely. Um, Taylor, thank you so much for, for taking time to, to talk with me. Is there anything else we can plug before we get out here? So the last blockbuster is available. Um, is available now. I, I saw it on Amazon Prime, and is it uh, available anywhere else? Yeah, it's on Amazon Prime, iTunes, Fandango, Vudu, Google Play, Google Play, and uh, cable and satellite VOD and stuff like that. Great, it's like a pretty wide release. And then pick it up, and here's to life. My first two movies are both on Amazon Prime. Excellent. And if you haven't, uh, and if you love ska, pick it up is incredible. Is your band, uh, is your bands like, do, do you have any recordings out there? Not really, like not on Spotify or any place where people get music. Um, but if you watch pick it up uh, through the credits, the second song that plays in the credits is my old band. Very cool. I'm going to go back and rewatch it. I was very excited to hear MC Lars. He's a buddy of mine. I, I like that that song of his he's great yeah he's he's awesome uh taylor thank you so much for this and and hopefully this isn't the only time we we work together if my career continues to go the way i feel like it's going so sounds great uh thank you very much this was really great i appreciate it yeah no problem That is a great look into what being a filmmaker in today's age uh, is. Um, and I did not know that we were going to come back around uh, to touring in, in Japan again, but I'm always so delighted when that happens. So that was uh, that was a really in, uh, incredible conversation. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to this. If you have not seen uh, Taylor's movie, The Last Blockbuster, definitely check it out. It is an uh, incredible watch. And if you're a fan of Ska and have not... Uh, seen uh, his other film uh, pick it up uh do yourself a favor and learn something about uh the genre because i did not i had no idea about ska's uh original political roots even though it makes total sense uh, that it would be there uh so uh definitely check that out as as well uh thank you guys so much for listening to this uh, that's our show for today uh if you enjoyed this and feel like you know a friend who might be interested in listening to this podcast as well um, we are coming up on almost 200 episodes of Between Awesome and Disaster, and I've been fortunate enough to have some really uh, awesome conversations with some very cool people. I've talked to, um, I have talked to Mitch Allen from SR71, Jared Reddick from Bowling for for Soup, uh, comedian Glenn Glenn Wool, um, Nick from Hit the Lights, Kevin from Hit the Lights, uh, as well as a lot of other uh, incredible musicians and comedians. Uh, thank you guys uh, for, for being a part of uh, the path to 200 episodes here. We are available wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, and Amazon Music, uh, and as and Pandora as well. And uh, if you guys are curious, um, you can go to my uh, Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash awesome disaster, and check out some of the uh, exclusive uh, content that I'm posting over there, as well as some, uh, some music that uh, before it... it gets released i also want to give a shout out to my supporter at the awesome producer level mary beth mooney thank you so so much for your support i sincerely appreciate it and thank you guys again for being here and uh i appreciate i appreciate it and i hope i feel i feel better uh and more uh hopeful uh now than i did last week so let's uh let's keep our let's let's reflect on let's reflect on on where we are now feel that relief and then uh and then also keep uh keep uh on fighting the good fight as they say so thank you guys so much for your uh support i really appreciate it and i will see you next time between awesome and disaster stay safe wear a mask and stomp out fascism wherever you see it take care everybody <laughs>